Here we go. We're going live. Yeah. Thank you, live. We're on. Well, welcome, everyone. We're coming to you from Albuquerque, New Mexico, here in the States, uh, here just uh, in the shadow of the Sandia Mountains and between the, uh, the, the Pueblo peoples. Uh, I just wanted to say that Good Medicine Way, if you've been with us a while, you'll know that uh, our order of worship is trying to be unique to who we are as Native people. I know most uh, order of worships all across the country and around the world really reflect it, like the 1500s uh, years of when Luther and others in the Catholic Church developed an order of worship. But then that carried over to the uh, Methodists and the Protestants and all of them. They just took that on and really didn't change it much, but kept using the same format. So our format here, as you'll see, is, is quite different. And uh, as you follow it, just uh, we'll introduce those to you. So coming to you from Albuquerque, I want to let you know that we are trying to do a service that is very decolonized, trying to break away from the structures that have been and create some new ones that will reach the Native people. And you're also a part of, I think is becoming one of the best places to have contextual teachings in the world as a virtual program. So you are a part of this new way of things so I wanted to introduce to you today, our MC is going to be Joe Lopez up there with the hat. Yeah, from California there, he's going to be our MC. So Joe, you can take it away. Thank you, Casey. Um, yeah, like Casey said, uh, my name is Joe Lopez, and um, I am on the traditional lands of the Tongva I'm here in Southern Los Angeles County. And um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, welcome everyone to a good medicine way. And I'm happy to see all my, my friends that are here and the, my new friends that are joining us today and um, everyone who gets to watch the recordings later on. I, uh, I wanted to just welcome you. Um, and I just open us up in a, in a prayer. Um, so if you would, uh, however you need to position yourselves for that, uh, I leave my eyes open and, and look around where I'm at. So um, creator, I just uh, look, think of uh, the sunrise in the east. Um, this morning and how you uh, you bring the new day the the, the new um, the newness of life um, and I and for me that's where uh, the rains come from uh, in the the warm rains um, and your warmth and your love uh, for us, I just uh, um, pray that for us, that we would remember that. And um, as we look to the West, uh, that, uh, yeah, that the, the sun sets in the West. And that's the end of our day, and the quietness that that brings. Um, I just pray that uh, we would be able to focus on the quietness that, that we get in our lives. Um, and we look to the north and the, the cool, um, strong winds uh, um, that come from there, that you would, that you, how you remind us how you are um, our strength and our protector. Um, to you um, and pray and I thank you for your your way that you made for us to connect to you and um, I just want to um, uh, invite our and invite our time uh, together that you would bless it and uh, we pray uh, these things in uh, creator sets free uh, way amen
And uh, so um, I also have uh, Creation Insights this week. And um, I, I like to spend more time thinking about this and, and knowing who's going to speak. And so, um, but um, it's just more of like a, a story in a way. Um, I was, I was running a couple weeks ago or like a week ago up in the mountains in Tahoe in central California here. <clears throat> and um, I was kind of on a, the ridge and I was looking, I was really, I was talking to my wife earlier that I knew, wanted to get some, uh, some wood from a tree that had uh, been struck by lightning for a project that I'm working on. <clears throat> and so I was running, it was kind of up in the Alpine and, and then I just kind of stopped in one spot and it was just really quiet. It was like an, an opening in in the Alpine, and it's kind of one of those places where you're like, I don't know, it's like the sky opened, and I don't know if like a deer was going to jump out in front of me or something like that. So, but it it did st it struck me, and um, I kind of stopped you know, for a while, let my heart kind of kind of like slow down, and. Um, and it was just really, really, really calm. And um, and right there, I, I was taking a water and, and there was a tree that had been struck by lightning. So I was able to get a couple pieces from that and put down my, um, my little offering to, to, to that. And so, I just lately I've been really enjoying those moments of of quiet, quiet reflection or quiet um, contemplation. Or um, I I live in LA. <laughs> it's a little hard to come by sometimes. So anyway, that's uh, that's what I had for this week for. For that um and let's see Me? Um, yeah casey hey. you're up for all right uh, this is america all right thank you joe thank you for that so this is our next order of worship here is this week on turtle island and uh, other people might have some other I, announcements too, or they know of something that happened this, during this time. Uh, we all know, and we're all celebrating, some of us in the United States uh, with fireworks and with celebration, with cookouts, um, Independence Day. So, and there's stories that you can go and talk about that, all of the things that have taken place to bring us to this this day today. And, uh, and most of us are, are traveling, <laughs> so, and we're visiting people, and we're camping out, and we're having a good time. And hopefully the rain will hold off here so that we can have a good show of fireworks. Uh, one thing that happens here in Albuquerque, I don't know, I, I, just because it's the southwest, is a lot of people like to shoot off their guns into the air. And uh, especially around New Year's, too, we are here gunshots shooting into the air and it's dangerous we all know and it, you know there's been catastrophes but uh, one thing that I wanted to bring up with uh, for this week in Turtle Island is that Jim Thorpe uh, we're recognizing Jim Thorpe this time because he was uh, one of the most famous native athletes to to live in he was from the Sac and Fox tribe and he went to Carlisle boarding school and he didn't like it. <laughs> I was reading a, a bit about him and I watched uh, on the way here, I was looking, listening to a little video clip about his life and that he was just such an extraordinary athlete. Uh, and then he, he was asked by 
different folks to represent the United States at the Olympics. And he did, and he won the uh, decathlon and uh, what is that? the other one? I can't think of what it is. Pentathlon? Just multiple things that he was so good at, just throwing the discus. And I found out that he wasn't good at throwing the javelin. And reason being is that he didn't know that you could get a running start <laughs> to throw it. But he still came in second place by standing still and throwing the javelin. So you can imagine how, how far it would have gone if he'd have thrown it with a running start. But uh, being such an athlete like that, I am personally, I'm starting to understand the, the extraordinary abilities of native athletes because, you know, my, my son is, is now going off to college now under a scholarship to run and they just see so much potential in him as a young, young athlete and they want to nurture that and I have really high hopes. I like to see him go to the Olympics in here in France coming up when they have the outdoor Olympics that would that would be great a few years from now when he's a junior, but uh, we just keep praying that he stays healthy But Jim Thorpe was uh, he he played football he played baseball and many many other sports he was so good at and he uh, died here uh, as late as uh, 1950 55 and one thing about his life when he uh, was uh, winning the gold medals he was not even a citizen of the United States because when he ran those uh, those Olympics and won the gold medals, it was before uh, 1924 when Native Americans were given citizenship. So it's kind of unique that um, it's somebody that as Native people we can look up to. I heard that he was very humble in his presentation, uh, that he carried himself that way and liked to teach young people about their abilities that they can push themselves harder than they think they can and do better than they think they can. He inspired a lot of young people to to bigger and better things. So with that I just wanted to introduce uh, Jim Thorpe and if you get a chance uh, Google it because there is a couple of short videos and there's a couple of long videos on his life and it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. So back to you Joe. Yeah, yeah, those two. Yeah. Hey, yeah, um, thank you, Casey. Um, introduce Grover. <laughs> They're gonna sing a song or two for us. And um, I think on, on on our side, I think the fan pretty well. Oh, the fan. Uh, should I turn the fan off? Sh should we turn the fan off? Okay. Oh. Oh, oh. Uh, yeah, girls, what you guys know? Okay, so we're gonna do. Couple songs here. Uh, we're gonna do the Lift You Up Round Dance, which is a round dance. Uh, I learned the melody from some uh, water protector uh, uh, actions um, that we've been to. So this is a round dance melody that they often use at those. And then we're also gonna do. Um, a song by Jonathan Miracle as the second song. So we'll just do those right back to back with each other and hopefully I'll be able to switch the words so you guys can follow along and please do sing along in your own spaces or dance or however Not the mute. square moves you. Not mute. Um, you're muted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and not the, because we're worried about how yeah, you sound, the, the, but the, because uh, the, the internet will put like a three second delay <laughs> uh, before you get back to us. So it'll, it'll be a little crazy.
folks out there, if you have a drum in your room there, if you have a shaker, uh, join in, uh, practice while we're doing our thing here. You can also do it where you're at. I was even telling uh, Leah here that even if you got an Altoids can, you know, with el uh, kind of half full of Altoids, use that as your shaker, you know, just, or if you got one in handy, you know, make one. Um, that's great, just join and win with us as we sing. Yeah, that's awesome, Casey. Thanks for the invite. Um, I just wanted to uh, welcome Heather Jim for, for some announcements and her wisdom. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> yeah, so hi, guys. Welcome, everyone. Um, my only announcements are the Wachoni camp is going to be this month, July 28th through the 31st. And um, if you're already registered and we're gonna see you there. And um, if not, like I, it's the first time I'm going, so I'm pretty excited. Um, so we'll see how that goes for me. Um, and the other one is the women's circle. Um, we meet every, Wednesday at seven and we're still going through the book of Hebrews and so um, yeah we welcome all the women um, who like to join us and um, if anyone else has any other announcements um, you feel free to jump in uh, if not I'll, I'll continue on okay um, and so we have uh, an offering page um, through PayPal um, and it's linked through our Facebook group. So if you feel um, led to give, um, that's the best way to do that. So thank you for everyone who's already been giving and continues to give, um, it, it does help out a lot. Um, so yeah, especially with like the First Nations versions and um, sending them out to all the people that need it. So it's been really a, good, a great blessing. Um, thank you. Unmute. Yeah. All right. All right. As you can tell, I was I was muted there, Heather. <laughs> but I wanted to uh, also reiterate that Ken Gingrich is with us, and he's gonna his group is gonna be sponsoring this dismantling your doctrine of discovery, and it's coming up here in just a couple of weeks here on July twenty second, twenty third, and twenty fourth, and it's gonna be here in Albuquerque. And uh, Ken has been attending here quite a bit now. And back in the day, uh, we found out that Ken Greenwich's uh, group, his church, started in the same location that we're at right now, and now they're meeting in their own location. Uh, but he keeps coming back. He's been a good, uh, you know, attender here. Uh, we've, we're really working with him well to see that this uh, doctrine of discovery will take off. Uh, we just made final arrangements also with uh, Mark Charles. Mark Charles will be our special speaker, not on a Monday, but he's going to be coming on on the Tuesday, uh, August 9th. So if you're in the area and you want to join, you can join us for Monday service, spend the night, and then also be here in person as Mark Charles will be speaking from right here on this stage here for us uh, on August 9th in the evening. We'll be having a small dinner beforehand and then we'll have him speak. And I'm sure that we'll have a nice crowd here that day. Uh, other things that are coming up, like you said, uh, the Wichoni Family Camp is coming up uh, really soon at the end of this month. Uh, Christina here is going to be going, joining us and I'll be going. Laura and I will be there. We'll be helping out in all kinds of areas and she's coming on to be a worker bee as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, Laura and I will be doing sweat lodges, men and women's sweat lodges. We'll be singing with Jonathan. And we'll also be making sure that the powwow and the vendors and all of that come off in a really good way. So other than that, I think that's, uh, the schedule is starting to pick up pretty, pretty heavy now. I was just looking at, um, I got four flights here in the next few months that I'm looking at my, wow. my itineraries. I try to keep one hard copy of it, but that's life is kind of getting back to normal and everybody be careful because uh, I, I just found out that a group of natives up at the Four Corners Ministry up there, the pastor got it 
and all of the all of the people of the board of their board also got it. So it's a pretty and the numbers have really just spiked over there. There's over 103 different people in that area that have COVID right now. Mm -hmm. So we can't let our guard down. You got to, you know, like she's wearing her mask now. You know, we're all double protected and triple vaccinated and all that we need to do and especially when you're in a crowd, wear your mask. If you're out, you know, by yourself, you're walking, those kind of things are fine, but when you're in a crowd, wear your mask just to be safe. So that's all the announcement I have. I'm sure there might be others, but uh, uh, I want to turn it back to you, Joe. Uh, or does, Ken, did you want to say anything Ken, else yeah. about the uh, dismantling the Doctrine of Discovery Coalition annual meeting? Sure. Can you, oh, can you hear me? Yep. 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 Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the main the main thing that would be of interest to to you all would be on Saturday, the twenty uh, third. It, it'll be a, a conversation about a multi inter, a multi generational approach to the work of dismantling some of the structures that uh, have have created such great injustice, um, and that'll that would be something that, you, that uh, I would if you want to if you want to do that. We'll have a link, and we'll figure out a way to. Um, to uh, maybe link it to this to this page or uh, live stream it in some way that uh, you all can watch it on Saturday morning. You might not be able to interact if we stream it that way, but um, but it would be about it probably two or three hours uh, of conversation about what we're calling a 100 year plan. Uh, we know it's going to take way more than than we ourselves are going to be able to do, but it has to do uh, with a lot of uh, policy work and that sort of thing um, because it's uh, it's it's uh, the, the, the doctrine of discovery is written into in so many insidious ways into our laws and they're cited, it's cited uh, even by the Supreme Court in various places um, as a way of displacing and uh, upholding uh, the system that we live with. And we, we need to have a more just system that returns and repairs and, and rebuilds um, our culture, the culture that we all live in now together. So anyway, hope uh, we'll we'll have more details in in a in a week or two. You can and good medicine way is one of those areas that has taken a step forward here to yeah. start that decolonization. Right. So right. Ken is also leading his group in that, and the group of Nate's uh, North American Institute for Indigenous Theological Studies has also you know just recently got full accreditation. Mm -hmm. And we have 19 professors, indigenous professors, that teach with us. And we're really breaking down those walls. And our speaker tonight is also going to be one of those, is uh, also breaking down those those walls as well. So back to you, Joe. Yeah, and we'll post info about that uh, <laughs> annual meeting on our Facebook page. Um, I don't have all the links right here accessible to me, yeah. so I don't want to throw up the wrong information. But uh, we'll, we'll post a, a whole post about it with the links about info for the site and if you want to register to come in person and how to get on their list to get the Zoom link and everything. So uh, if you're interested in that, uh, keep an eye on the Good Medicine Way uh, Facebook wall and info about it will appear there within the next day or two. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, um, did uh, did my friend Namar make it tonight? I didn't yeah. get to scroll through here. He's up there. <laughs> hey. All right. So, uh, yeah. You see no. Namar, you're the man. <laughs> <laughs> You're on our schedule here to read Genesis 3. Is that right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Genesis, Genesis 3, 3 from Creator's Word. Good evening, everyone. How y'all doing? It's great to see y'all. All right. So, can you all hear me okay? Okay. I asked because... I'm having internet, the connection issues right now is going in and out. So please bear with me. 
I'm going to be reading from the New Life version. And interestingly enough, I, I got this Bible as a gift while I was in Albuquerque. So how about that? Okay, so if you would please join me in Creator's Word, we're in Genesis chapter 3. All right, are you all with me? All right. Okay, Genesis chapter 3 reads, man does not obey God. Now the snake was more able to fool others than any animal of the field which the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say that you should not eat from any tree in the garden? Then the woman said to the snake, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. From, but from the tree, which is in the center of the garden, God has said, do not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The snake said to the woman, no, you for sure will not die. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and bad. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eyes and could feel the desires of making one wise. So she took its fruit and ate. She also gave some of her, she also gave some to her husband and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were without clothes. So they sewed fig trees, fig, fig leaves together and made themselves clothing. Then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the evening. The man and his wife hid themselves from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man. He said to him, where are you? And the man said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was without clothes. So I hid myself. The Lord God said, who told you that you were without clothes? Have you eaten from the tree of which I told you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the snake fooled me and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the snake, because you have done this, you will be hated and will suffer more than all cattle and more than every animal on the field. You will go on your stomach and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will make you and the woman hate each other. And your seed and, you, and her seed will hate each other. He will crush your head and you will crush his heel. To the woman, he said, I will make your pain much worse in giving birth. You will give birth to children in pain. Yet your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Then he said to Adam, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I told you, do not eat from it. The ground is cursed because of you. By hard work, you will eat from food from all the days of your life. It will grow thorns and thistles for you. You will eat the plants of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your face because of hard work until you return to the ground. Because you were taken from the ground. You are dust. You will return to dust. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord made clothes of skins for Adam and his wife and dressed them. Then the Lord God said, see, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and bad. Now then, he might put out his hand and take from the tree of life also and eat and live forever. So the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out and he placed 
Cherubim, east of the Garden of Eden, with the sword of fire that turned every way, that kept watch over the path to the tree of life. Thanks, Namar. Um, I uh, want to uh, hope Brian is going to do. Um, All right, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to introduce our speaker tonight. Um, besides sharing the same first name, I really don't know that much about him. <laughs> but I have, uh, in putting together the artwork for the announcement and this kind of stuff, um, I did a lot of research on his writings um, and on the. Uh, the traditional uh, Samoan stories that he'll be referencing tonight too. So it's we're in for a real uh, treat tonight, um, and he's uh, he's coming to us uh, from Independent Samoa. So that's about 19 hours ahead of where we are here in a uh, uh, Tewa land in so-called Albuquerque, New Mexico. So so for us, it's a voice from the future. That we're, <laughs> but, uh, all right, without further ado, and uh, Brian, I, I apologize right now if I really mess up the uh, Samoan names, so uh, feel free to just uh, fix that <laughs> when, you, when you come on, and please get further information uh, about yourself. But uh, Brian Fiyukolia is a second-generation Australian-born Samoan. He hails from the Samoan villages of Sili, Sadapuala, Faliasila and Tufutofue. He is an ordained minister from the Congregational Christian Church in Samoa and a lecturer in Hebrew, Bible, and Old Testament at Malua Theological College in Samoa. He also serves as an adjunct lecturer at Trinity Theological College in Narms, now so called Melbourne, Australia, and he also holds a PhD from the University of Divinity in Narms. And most importantly, he is a husband to Tanaria and a father to Elakai. And without any further ado, I hand it over to Brian Coley. Thanks uh, so much, um, Brian, for that wonderful introduction. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know what else to, to add to that, um, to that introduction, um, apart from perhaps the fact that um, um, I'm uh, zooming in here from the future. Um, so um, I'm here in, uh, in Samoa, which uh, is independent Samoa, as, a, um, as opposed to American Samoa, which is uh, on the east side. Um, and American Samoa, is, uh, as some of you will, would probably uh, realize, is actually a, um, uh, a territory of, of the United States. Um, so they're still under colonization at the moment. Um, uh, but where we've, we on the Western, uh, uh, Western side, we're, we're independent um, and we've been independent since 1962, I think. Um, so we're celebrating 60 years of independence this year. Um, so I think when borders open up here around August, uh, things will um, start to take form in terms of what the celebratory visions would be of, um, of our independence celebrations. Um, so yeah, uh, um, my, my interest um, is uh, decolonizing uh, ways of reading um, and utilizing um, native um, and indigenous references of knowledge and wisdom um, in approaching the biblical texts. Um, and therefore reading it from a decolonizing point of view, uh, but specifically from the point of view of, a, uh, of an Australian-born Samoan, um, a person who exists in between spaces. Uh, right now I'm located in Samoa, but um, I did grow up in Australia for a fair bit of my, my life. Um, so um, I, I sort of have, um, a, you know, a variety of layers of, to my identity. So um, 
I'm seeking to explore some of that in, um, in, in my presentation today. Uh, I did get a message from uh, Leah um, about um, a, a, perhaps a condensed version of something that I, that I was going to speak about today. And so apologies, I haven't really condensed it to, um, but I, I will try and speak quickly so that it seems like it's condensed. <laughs> um, am I able to share screen? I think I am. Okay. Yeah, you should be able to. Okay, cool. Ooh. Okay. All right, you guys can see that, right? Okay. Okay. So the title of my presentation is uh, Even the Serpent, Someone Love Story. And, and I'm using Fangongo to, to read or reread uh, the Genesis um, that was uh, read uh, wonderfully by Nama. And, and I appreciate Nama for, um, for reading that and, um, and, and allowing us to hear the story as opposed to reading it. So you have the vision here of a uh, traditional Samoan uh, house that we call Thali. Um, and you can see uh, it's late in the evening. Um, it's probably just the end of supper. It's at the end of supper time, and um, now they're just getting ready to rest. But just before Samoan's rest, um, we, we'd like to hear a, a whangungo. Um, and this is the word for uh, Samoan folk, uh, folk tales. Um, so just going back to the title, Whangungo, there you can see with, the, uh, with that um, that sort of dash on top of the A. Um, Whangongo is, is our uh, native uh, story, um, our, our traditional um, folk, time, folk, folk tales. So, um, and so you can see here, this is a typical setting uh, for, for storytelling. You know, late in the evening, inside the Samoan Pale, um, and you can see that um, people are, are sitting around waiting uh, to hear a story. And if you sort of recall the beginning of that animated movie, Moana, um, where, then, uh, where the old lady is telling the story uh, to the children um, of Maui and Te Fiti, then um, we can imagine such a story, such a fun uh, But the story um, it enhances the night feel, as you can see in this, uh, in this picture, um, and makes you want to enter the mystical world um, of Whangungo or the mystical world of the story. So Whangungo is, um, is the art of Samoan storytelling that involves a space where mythical encounters um, occur between mortal heroes or um, ancient gods um, and immortal legends. Uh, and they sort of uh, exist in the space where the impossible becomes uh, possible. And it's a space where spirits roam, um, animals possess human-like qualities, and it's a space where animals speak and have conversations with humans. Um, it's also, you'll also see in, some, see in some stories that animals have relations with humans. So such um, stories spring to life through Talanoa. And uh, you might have been, uh, you might be familiar with this uh, Pacifica term, Talanoa. Uh, but according to Shone Javier, uh, Talanoa is a common term in Pacifica. Um, it is the confluence of three things, according to Javier, story, telling, and conversation. Talanoa is not story without telling and conversation, telling without story and conversation, or conversation without telling and story. Talanoa is all three, story, telling, and conversation as one. So the idea is that um, you know, a story is dead if there's no telling and there's no conversation, um, you know, to ensue from that story. Uh, telling is, is useless if there is no story and, and, if you, and if there's no conversation to come from the telling, then that telling was, you know, pretty lame. Um, it was pretty much a lecture um, as opposed to just telling a story. And, you, and, if, and conversation cannot happen if story and telling aren't done properly. So 
This is the whole essence of Talanoa. Now, I want to use Whangungo here, therefore, um, and Whangungo is a manifestation of Talanoa in that sense, um, as a method of breeding. Um, and so when we, the idea of Talanoa is so that we don't use the, the, the magic, um, lose the magic, sorry, of storytelling. Um, and in Whangungo, stories are the telling um, of truths as opposed to the telling of the truth. Um, so while, you know, the mystical world of, of Whangungo can be quite, you know, uh, beyond the imagination, um, they do still tell certain truths or certain life truths. Um, in Whangungo as well, there's an emphasis of uh, hearing or Whalungo, the story. Um, and, um, you know, this is why I'm grateful to Nama for his reading because we were able to Whalungo uh, the story. We were able to hear the story. Um, and, and this is this is something that um, that a lot of historical critics tend to lose sight of um, the hearing of that story, um, as opposed to treating it as just uh, as literature. Um, and Fangongo, therefore, is also uh, in a way that we can provide an alternative reading of Genesis three one to nineteen as a love story, um, in light of this Samoan uh, tale known as Sina and the Eel or Sina and the Tuna. Tuna is the Samoan word for eel. So, in, in, a, in a sense, what we are doing here is a hearing of the whanungo, of the storyteller. Um, and um, in that hearing, um, we want to, uh, we're seeking to hear whether there is an oral aspect uh, to Genesis 3, 1 to 19. Um, and I think, so uh, at this stage, we can say that there is um, already by hearing what, um, how Nama was reading the story today, um, and uh, yeah, it, the, 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 you know, when you're hearing the story, you're, you're imagining images being captured in your mind, in your head, taking you to a different world. Um, so this is what we, um, this is what Fa Mung was seeking to, to achieve. Um, and it's, it's also a decolonizing of non, um, decolonizing of non-Indigenous thought. Um, you know, we're, we're so attuned and so accustomed to, 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 um, you know, the Western thinking and, and you know, the Western ideas. Um, but here it's a, a sort of reclaiming of our indigenous um, and our native uh, voices. So Whangungo therefore is indigenous to Samoan people. Um, Western methodologies uh, sadly do not resonate with a lot of indigenous beliefs um, and understanding. So, in that, in that, um, in saying that, I, I want to draw upon the Fangongo of Sina, um, or the story of Sina and her rendezvous uh, with the eel, the tuna. I will attempt to reread the story of Eve's own meeting with the serpent or with the snake uh, through this Fangongo. But before we do that, um, I want to address um, that you know, despite the mystical world, there is a reality behind the mystical world, and that's the reality of Pacifica. In all the romanticized perceptions of, um, of the islands of Pacifica, tourists forget that the land, and, um, and the land is uh, communicated through these um, native words, Fanua uh, in Samoa, Fonua in Tonga, Vanua in Fiji, Fenua in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, the land is not as romantic as it may seem. Behind the exotic scenery lies the harsh realities of climate change and rising sea levels where the lands of the Giribas, Tuvalu, Tokelau, and the Marshall Islands are faced with severe land loss. So this is therefore a quest to Falong, to hear the story of Eve and the serpent as Falong. A certain reality is weaved into the story much like how Pacifica realities are weaved into Falong. Whangungo are magical stories, but beneath lies the emotion and reality of the land and its people. So Whangungo as a hermeneutical lens or Whangungo as a way of reading implies that the text is a tala. Uh, the word tala means story or tale, but can also mean to open or to unpack. So when a Whangungo is told, it is a package uh, layered with meanings that need to be tala, to be unpacked, to be unfolded. So the process of tala does not mean discarding away of the package, 
packaging, but like the presentation of a Nyetonga uh, pictured here, which is a traditional Samoan fine met, the whole thing is part of the final product. So to tell the whole story and, um, and for the audience to fight along the whole story in its entirety. More importantly, Fangongo is decolonizing as it gives indigenous readers the opportunity to read the story in light of their own context, to highlight oppressive and colonizing voices with the hope that indigenous readers can locate the liberating message in the text. So uh, the Fangongo of Even the Serpent, the tale. Um, and I'm just going to go straight into telling the story. So in the village of uh, Matavai here in, uh, in Samoa, there was this beautiful Taupo. Um, and Taupo is the name given to the high chief's daughter, who under Samoan custom must be a virgin. Um, and word of her beauty traveled far um, and wide, attracting a young man. Now, um, now, this young man, knowing that she would often come to the village rock pool to bathe, he turned into an eel um, uh, to live inside this, uh, this rock pool. Um, so that you know, uh, to, so that he can uh, sort of gaze on this woman um, each time she comes down. Now Sina did not fear the eel and would meet with him every time she went to bathe. Uh, however, as the eel grew fonder of Sina, she began to fear the eel. The eel continually urged uh, Sina to to live with him, but Sina found the request impossible, and so she left him. Hurt by Sina's absence, the eel sought death as his only option, for he could no longer be with Sina. But before his death, he wanted Sina to bury his head. From his head, a tree will grow, and as a result, the coconut tree was born. So every time you husk a coconut, the coconut resembles a face of which is said to be the face of the eel, whose heart was broken by the love of his life. Now, the Sina Fangungo is etiological. Um, and eti etiological um, refers to stories that explain the cause of things or cause of events. Um, but it is, um, and so for the Sinafang, it's the explanation of how the coconut tree um, came into being. But it is also a love fangu, it's a love story. And this is what we view when we, um, when we tell her or open up the fangu. We have view of an etiological fangu, but also a fangu of love. Now, in the same vein, I seek to um, open up or tell up the Genesis story of Eve and the Serpent to explore things from the Sinafango that can be heard from the Genesis story, namely things such as seduction, agency, and the significance of fruit. Now, the idea of seduction in Genesis 3 is not new. Uh, the goal behind the serpent seduction is quite commonly associated with the fruit. However, I find that like the eel in the Sinafango, uh, the serpent is interested, or the snake is interested in the woman, including the woman's nudity. Three verse, uh, if you hear again, um, Neymar's uh, reading of three verse one, the Hebrew word uh, used to describe the snake um, uh, is, is this word arum, uh, which means shrewd or smart or clever. Yet it sounds very similar to the, word, the Hebrew word erom, uh, which is the word for naked. So Gordon Wenham uh, writes this really, uh, and I think this is quite clever what he says, that they will seek themselves to be shrewd, but will discover that they are new. Now, the question to arise from the Sinafa Ngomo is why did the man turn into an eel? Now, the eel in Samoan mythology is a phallic symbol, so its sexual connotations are obvious. Um, and J. Harold Ellens claims that serpents or snakes were also a phallic symbol in antiquity or in ancient times. However, I contend that I contend that taking the form of an eel meant that there was room for exploitation or perhaps sexploitation. Knowing that Sina would come down to the rock pool, it was the perfect place to gaze on Sina. For the serpent then, or for the snake, he was able to move about freely and admire Eve. His movements and his access to Eve dictates, for Eve was nude and the serpent had moved all along. But Eve had many, had be, may have been mesmerized by the serpent's seduction, just as Sina had been dazzled by the eel. When her eyes were opened, she realized she was new. Now I can hear the echoes of the Sina Fangomo here when Eve realizes her nakedness. It is the unraveling of the serpent's request to Eve 
The serpent tells Eve in 3 verse 5 that she and her husband will become like gods. As seduction, it was an invitation for Eve to come, come to his world, the world of gods. And Eve was seduced to the point that not only did she eat the fruit, but she also seduced Adam into eating it also. This seduction caused Eve's downfall. In both cases, the seduction was overwhelming, and in both cases, they cover up as Sinner leaves the rock pool never to return, while Eve uh, sews together fig leaves to hide her nakedness. The theme of agency is something also that we that we can hear in both tales. Both Eve and Sina showed agency. Fang Ong shows Eve to be a woman of nobility. Eve, like Sina, is considered to be um, Dao Bo. Now, going back to our first slide, Dao Bo is the word given to the title of the, honor, uh, the, the daughter of the high chief. And it's an honorable title given to the daughter of the high chief. In the Genesis Fang Ong, Eve is a Dao Bo. She is the daughter of the high chief, Yahweh. Eve has often been portrayed as the culprit in the fall. Yet like Sinna, Eve is a Taupo, and she's also a daughter of a high chief. And as Taupo, she is given stature as leader. She may not have made the best decision, but she did make the decision. The onus and the pressure of being a decision maker is usually afforded to men in the biblical narrative. Eve, a Taupo, turns the tide against such misogynist attitudes as she becomes the commander of her destiny. Eve is a woman of agency. She is a Taupo. And the last thing that I want to look at is the fruit. The image of Sina drinking from the coconut is rather sexual when considering the image of the coconut. The coconut is depicted as the head of the eel with its two eyes and mouth. When Sina's lips are planted on the coconut for a drink, it is as though Sina is kissing the eel and enjoying its juices. It is not known what sort of fruit Eve ate, but the image of Sina drinking the coconut may add an element of sensuality to Eve's eating of the fruit. And for Samoan readers or indigenous readers or other coconut lovers. The seduction by the Eve by the serpent was sure to have an effect on Eve's senses. And as a result, she enjoyed the fruit so much that she was willing to seduce her husband into eating it also. So conclusion. Firstly, uh, the Tongan scholar Ebili Awofa, the late Tongan scholar, argues that our island ancestors did not conceive of their world in microscopic proportions. Their universe comprised not only land surfaces, but the surrounding ocean or the moana, as far as they could traverse and exploit it. Now, this is conveyed a lot in Whangungo, as the world in Whangungo is macroscopic in scope. Colonial attitudes have long caused islanders to believe in their tiny existence as just a dot on the map. Yet Whangungo manifests how offers contention, and this is my contention also. As I mentioned earlier, Whangungo is decolonial because Whangungo liberates islanders from such colonial attitudes that diminish our identity. So when reading Genesis 3 from a Whangungo perspective, the Eden narrative is therefore macroscopic. It is macroscopic in the sense that as an alternative to it being a story that takes place in the garden, the encounter between Eve and the serpent can also be seen as a crossing of boundaries between spaces. Secondly, Whangungo is liberating. It is liberating for women. In Whangongo, women are powerful, women of stature. Sina was a woman of stature, a taupo. Eve, from an islander perspective, is also a taupo, and therefore a woman of stature. Eve is not the culprit. She is the master of her fate, the mother of all humanity. This is the core of indigenous readers who see women being reduced to culprits and scapegoats for women to be given the respect and stature that they deserve. Finally, Dalaing up stories enables to see the whole Dala in all its complexity. And as we see with the story of Eve and the serpent, there is more to it than just an etiology explaining how the first human couple came to be alienated from the peaceful Irenaic conditions of the Garden of Eden. What we see and hear are the ripples of Fang Ong illuminating other layers of the Genesis narrative that tend to be discarded. So the efforts of this Fang Ong reading were a reclaiming of those layers to discover alternative readings of the Tala. And those readings, these readings, Tala, open up the world of the text to macroscopic proportions, which can be both liberating and magical, but at the same time, tragic. Thank you.
I guess should I ask that question first? You or could? Well, yeah. Let's open it up for questions. <clears throat> questions and comments. Because no, yeah, no that's preaching. The, that's and a, well, no, no preaching. Conversation, right? Yeah. It's part of the town know it. So we yeah. got, we got to have the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> but you can ask that first one. We had a question off of the live stream on YouTube. All right, she says, where is your artwork from? It's Is it depicting Samoan art, culture, contextualized? Um, yeah, it's uh, various uh, artwork from uh, um, Samoan artists um, that, that live both here in Samoa and abroad. Um, and so a lot of those artworks, um, they depict the, the, the native uh, stories um, and some of them use um, native uh, colors and techniques um, in order to, um, to to sort of uh, what to say to sort of nativize uh, you know the mediums that are often used by artists around the world um, and, and, and and adding to the the storytelling. So yeah. Observation I'd like to share. Uh, the man in uh, the Samoan story then is uh, uh, the eel doesn't really have a relationship of anything to the man, and it, all the relationship is with the with, with the woman, right? Showing showing that there's a uh, connection of power already. That the male is already subservient to the world of spirituality. Uh, so that's one thing I, I pointed out there is that even in the uh, the, the biblical story too, the, the the serpent speaks with the woman, not with the man, to make the seduction and and cause them the, the fall to take place. But uh, I always had uh, the comment that I, I guess I'm channeling Richard right now. <laughs> Richard would say that uh, if if the Samoan people, or even with Adam and Eve, if they would have been Indian or native, they wouldn't have ate the apple, they would have ate the snake. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, uh, I think that's, that, that applies across the board, doesn't it? Um, you know, uh, native people, indigenous people are uh, mainly gatherers and hunters, and so... Yeah, if you've got the option of meat and fruit uh, before you, obviously you're going to take meat. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I uh, found kind of interesting that I didn't think much of until in your talk here, you talked about the whole concept of the uh, Talanoa, was that when, uh, when I was looking up uh, uh, different things about these uh, Samoan stories um every page i went to they would have the story but they always had a recording of an elder like reading the story and i was like oh that's kind of cool but but then we when you said that oh no if you don't tell the story then then you're not really hearing the story you can't just read it off the page so i i thought that was interesting that even in the stuff i found on the internet that they were being true to that that concept that that you yeah. brought up, Faith and I think that's that that really also shows um, the importance of oral histories. I think a lot of times in colonized people, you see uh, a de-emphasis and a discrediting of oral histories as being unreliable. Um, you know, unless it's yeah. written, you know, then it's not accurate. And like somehow an oral story isn't as accurate, but yet. When you look at cultures that have oral histories, oftentimes the, the, the knowledge of the stories is much more accurate within the, the community as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, because everybody gets, everybody hears the story. Everybody's involved in the storytelling. Everybody's involved in the conversation afterwards. So there's a much deeper uh, knowledge of the story within the community as a whole rather than when you have these kind of written histories that unless you bother going and dusting off the book and looking through it, you know, most people don't know those histories. And I think you really see that in a lot of Western cultures where there's a very uh, 
poor understanding of our own histories, um, I think, because of that. But I don't know if you have any other insights um, to add into that. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And, and I totally agree. Um, uh, and, and that's the, the sad thing about um, this whole preference for written history um, over oral history, um, because obviously it, 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 um, it prioritizes uh, Western cultures um, and, the, and the Western, um, you know, way of thinking um, over, you know, a lot of uh, Indigenous cultures around the world. But at the same time, um, the beauty about oral culture is that, um, and you'll find this, uh, you know, pretty uh, clear in, in, in our Pacifica context, is that there's so much diversity that you'll find um, because it's not just one voice telling the story. Um, there are multiple voices, um, and those multiple voices, um, you know, they're connected through the story, and it's and, and the stories actually in turn connect villages, um, and they connect islands. Um, so, you know, the, the, the diversity in voices um, you you would hear, um, it it sort of adds the layers to the story, um, but at the same time, those layers. Um, they, they, they're interconnected um, and, and therefore they establish uh, the, you know, the, the relationships between uh, people, between villages, between, um, you know, uh, districts. Um, and, and so in Samoa, we have this saying called um, uh, which means uh, in Samoa, there are, there are many, uh, there are many uh, testimonies or many versions of the same story. So I mentioned the beginning of this story when I was telling it, um, is that uh, it's a village, I mean, I'm telling the, 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 the story from the village of Matavai where the rock pool uh, is located. Um, but Sina has, the, the woman in the story has connections to other villages and those other villages will tell their version of this same story. Um, and, you know, and this is why you'll have multiple voices and you find that in oral tradition, uh, in oral traditions. In written traditions, it's only what you've got in front of you that, um, you know, you, there's, there's no real sort of, uh, you know, it's only the words on the page in front of you. And that's, that's pretty much it, isn't it? Um, it's, you know, the, you, you can't really explore diversity when you've only restricting yourself to this uh, document in front of you. Whereas oral traditions, you've got so much diversity and that just makes it, um, makes our histories more beautiful, uh, in my opinion. I think that also that you know, even though the word is in front of you, it, uh, there, there is a diversity of it because it was written, let's say, from a white North Atlantic male perspective, mm -hmm. rather than, let's say, in Nate's, in our, in our group, mm -hmm. someone to take mm -hmm. that same story and write it from a North American indigenous perspective. Mm -hmm. so it is, the same story can be, not just the... the the one printed on the page. You got to take the yeah. context of who wrote That's it right. and then who's rewriting it. Yeah. And yeah. Yes. Uh, one thing yeah, I and had that's, is, and that's, oh, yeah. one thing I had is storytelling. Uh, you said that in two different villages it can have this the same story, but it's kind of a different version. And in my traditions in Michigan here, when they, when you follow their tr religious traditions, uh, and as and a. Uh, someone that is uh, apprenticing into the into the religion they have to re retell the story the same way that the teacher said then mm -hmm. it's like then they pass and then they cross into the next realm of a uh, you know stage mm -hmm. of their their walk yeah. but they, mm -hmm. they're always corrected to make sure that they tell the story yeah. the way that the the teacher heard it and mm -hmm. so there's always a kind of a uh, there's a check and balance on that to make sure the story is correct as it moves forward. That's, yeah. that's my tradition in Michigan. Yeah, we, it it's, a, it, it's similar um, in, in the sense that uh, in the, in, within that diversity, there has to be consistent, consistency. Um, so if we take, um, you know, Matavai's tradition of the Sinna story, um, mm -hmm. that has to be consistent from generation to generation, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so the diversity doesn't occur within that tradition. It occurs in this Stalanoa with other traditions. Um, so that's where the diversity occurs, if, if that's, um, that makes sense. 
tradition. But in Turn Michigan, oh. we were muted for a second. Okay, I was speaking of that one particular religious uh, native tradition, but around yeah. them are variations of that tradition. Yeah. So they yeah. would have, like your story, they would were similar in that manner yeah. as indigenous peoples. Yeah. I have a comment question. Can you hear me okay? From yeah. way over here? Okay. <laughs> I really, it was very refreshing the subversion of the patriarchal and colonial gaze, especially towards women. And I'd love to hear, um, are there other, because I, I feel like a lot of times scripture from the colonial patriarchal lens, women are just seen as temptresses or you know, like, um, from a very negative connotation. Not always, but um, through that lens. I'm wondering how you've seen throughout scripture women continue to be given stature, continue be, to be given honor um, in the stories um, from from Samoa. Is this, are, you, are you talking about the biblical text? Yes, the retelling yeah. of stories. Mm. Yeah, um, that, that's something that I'm really interested in. Um, and, uh, you know, with, with this, this uh, tale, um, you know, the, with the, the act of tallying up, um, you know, I compare the presentation of a fine map there that you saw um, where the package becomes part of the final uh, pro uh, presentation um, as opposed to, say, you know, any other item that has packaging, you, you sort of discard the packaging afterwards. Um, but um, through Tala, you're interested in the packaging. So you're interested in all those other details, um, as suppressed as they may seem, but you're interested in it. You want to hear all those things. Um, so, you know, I feel that every time we read a story where women are being suppressed and, uh, you know, being subjugated, I think there's an opportunity for us to hear other things in that same story, which can liberate um, the woman. Uh, and, and, and I think if you look hard enough, you will find it. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a challenge, um, but it's a challenge worth pursuing. Yeah, it reminds me of uh, Will Gaffney talks about something mm -hmm. called sanctifying imagination. And it reminds yeah. you of that it's refreshing of what are the other things going on in the story from our own cultural lenses? Yeah, and and her, and her book, uh, the Woman's Midrash, uh, you know that, you know that's a wonderful uh, piece that I sort of recommend everyone to to, to get yeah. their hands on. Um, yeah, Will Gaffney's work in that is is brilliant. I thought it was interesting how you were talking about how what the difference is in the traditional stories, like the different villages and the different places have their version of the story. And I think a lot of times in our uh, kind of the so-called modern Western culture, we're very like didactic and narrow and like, oh, well, this is the true story and these other things are just mistellings of it. But really what you're seeing is you're seeing the story from a different perspective. So, uh, and I, and I, I don't know, there was probably at least uh, five or six different versions of, of that story of, of, of Sina and Nigil that, that I went through. And yet I really felt like, like one of them was more from the perspective of her relatives in the village who were a little like leery about the eel. And I think you even have different perspectives of how one's own perspective can change. Because you definitely have the aspect of, like, initially Cena um, also loves the eel, but because of how when their how the relationship develops, then she grows to kind of fear the eel, and so her own perspective in the story even changes. And I think like different tellings of it emphasize different parts of that. But I think like you know I think there's there's great value and bringing those perspectives in and getting out of our kind of scientific narrow way of looking things and kind of colonized culture and really understanding that you can have one story and you can have many different perspectives 
on that yeah. same story and they're all equally valid and equally true and if they seem to be in conflict then we just need to get our minds to open up a little more to be able to see the full picture and not yeah. just our own narrow view yeah and, 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 and you know the bible is full of contradictions and, and, and ambiguities um, but rather than trying to solve them Maybe it's best that we just leave the, you know, and um, and and, um, and and just uh, appreciate the diversity um, that, that that you can hear, um, rather than trying to harmonize them and trying to to solve, uh, you know, you know, we, we, the, the, the the problems, you know, you hear the synoptic gospels being referred to as the synoptic problem. Um, why should it be a problem? Um, I think diversity is a beautiful thing. Um, and we, I think reading the Bible that way, in appreciation of diversity and um, and, and variety and, and all that, um, is, is is a good thing. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's uh, now I've lost my train of thought. Um, <laughs> uh, there was something there that you said that sort of got me, um, uh, but now it's gone somewhere. So <laughs> hopefully it'll come back. I was uh, thinking as you were sharing is. I love that it gives the hearers active participation with the spirit. And I'm often thinking in innates, we talk a lot about how, you know, creator was speaking to indigenous people for millennia before any text was written. So why would creator not continue to speak? And as we read the text and imagining, you know, different points of view. So yeah, thank you. Yeah. And, and, and I think I've remembered now the the thing that um that, that I wanted to respond to um with, uh, to Brian was saying um and I, I totally agree about the whole um because it's you know this whole narrow uh, thinking it, it stems from this obsession over the historicity of these stories uh, you know did these stories occur um, you know and we, we become so focused on on that that we lose sight of the message behind these stories and therefore the orality of these stories because you know it's funny that we're worrying about the historicity yet these same historical critics say that these uh these bi uh, biblical tales started out of oral traditions um so it's funny that they're obsessed about the historicity and yet in their very very much in their arguments they're saying that there is an orality to these stories so the orality is what we're trying to reclaim through this uh, through, um, this indigenous uh, uh, perspective, and this native perspective, so that we can uh, we appreciate the message in the story. Very cool. Any other questions, comments, perspectives out there from anybody? Well, thank you for being a part of the the Nates community as well. <laughs> yeah, no, that's uh, I'm, I'm uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm sort of honoured to to be part of that. Um, I, had, I had spoken with Naomi Wolf, uh, as you may all uh, know, and um, yeah, it was it's really uh, exciting to be part of um, you know this uh, wonderful group and um, moving forward. Um, in uh, trying to decolonize further the you know the Western methodologies of reading and 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 uh, approaching of the biblical text, so yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, thank you so much. I love that you like you were saying it's like reclaiming orality, reclaiming oral culture. Thank you. All right. Well, Joe, introduce our next song. Yeah, uh, I'm not muted this time, so that's uh, that's a step up, I guess, or maybe not. Um, yeah, uh, I just I wanted to thank you, Brian. Um, I appreciate the the storyteller narrative as well, and it speaks a lot to my heart. So. Um, I just wanted to hand it over to the Grovers for some some sweet tunes. 
All right, we're just going to do our, uh, our, our classic round dance for the closing song. Everybody, everybody grab your shakers. Yeah, grab your shakers. You got a, you got a space uh, where you're at where you can get up and do a little round dance step. Or a vitamin bottle, whatever you got. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah. A tabletop. Yeah, you get anything that'll make noise, you yeah. can uh, you can feel free to to do that. Um, uh, <laughs> okay, okay, so carry it away. Thank you, Grovers. Um, is uh, Preston still here? Yes. Yes. Preston's in the house. Preston. Hello, oh, Preston. Preston in the, his house. Right, yeah. <laughs> He's in the car. <laughs> Got a lot Hello, of cars. Everybody. <laughs> it was really great. And that was a very great way to remind us in a different perspective on history and while storytelling is very important and I was kind of thinking about it's like not only do we miss the opportunity to hear the dynamics and hear the the fluctuation of notes that could happen in oral history but we're very missing how it could resonate to us when it's told if we're only reading it we're just losing all that that vibration there. So um, with that, let's give a vibration of prayer and, and a blessing of Sendoth. 
Heavenly Father, Creator, thank you for get, having us be gathered in your. We know that you are here. You're allowing us to hear different areas and having us be able to put words and thoughts to the process that are we all been working on. Different us, different perspectives of how you tell us different things and how you're telling us different ways of our lives and how we need to be ready to hear you into anything. Thank you for the great vibrations of drums that we got to hear from the Grovers. Allow those vibrations to continue through the week and allow us to remind us that you are there and that you are preeminent in everything. Remind us that you are always forgiving and always there to help and always there to remind us that we can never screw up. In your good name we pray. Keep us in positive light of you and have this blessing continue forth to everyone. In good name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys. Love you guys. <clears throat> See you next week. All right. Do you want to stick around for just a little bit after? We'll be uh, visiting just a little bit. Give you some connection to the world.